All right. This is a record crowd, by the way. We are so happy that all of you could join us this evening. Before I begin, uh, if I may just first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past, present, and future. So I hope you're excited about today's talk. Uh, I certainly am. How many of you are here for the first time? Well, if you are, welcome to the University of Queensland's Bris Science monthly free lecture. And for those of you who are here, um, and if this is not your first time or you're one of our regulars, um, I hope you missed me. <laughs> okay. So my name is Guri and I'm from the School of Biological Sciences at UQ and I'm your irregular host. And um, what we, I mean, I, I really, I, I actually have a confession to make. Um, you know, I really never always wanted to be a scientist. When I was very little, I always aspired to be an actor, an artist, you know, a dramatist. And one day, my big break in Hollywood perhaps would be to play an inanimate corpse on CSI. <laughs> and, I, and, and that would be a dream come true. And you're right here in the right place because today we have the real Dr. Bones. And we're really privileged to have Dr. Susan Hay Hayes from the University of Wollongong give our, give our talk tonight. But just a few notes on housekeeping. Uh, if you require the bathrooms, know that they are conveniently located down the hall, first exit on your right. Alternatively, you can go down the first flight of stairs just behind these doors, and you'll find the bathrooms there. Okay, We've, um, on your way in, hopefully you've picked up a slip of paper that is for you to write your questions down. Otherwise, you can write your questions via Twitter using the hashtag BrizScience, hashtag BrizScience. That's a double S in there. Okay, so use that hashtag and, um, and I'll get through as many questions as we can and hopefully we have time for everyone's questions today. The format of tonight's talk will be something slightly different. Uh, Susan is going to give um, uh, I mean, uh, an incredibly comprehensive talk, but in a, in a, in a short amount of time because we're going to dedicate the bulk of time today to some questions and answers because that will be the most effective way um, we can present the material to you today. So keep those questions coming. Otherwise, I would like to have the distinct privilege of introducing Susan, Dr. Susan Hayes. And Susan actually went through a very unconventional path to get to where she is today because she didn't start off as a scientist. She graduated with a degree in humanities from the University of Murdoch. She then later pursued a master's in fine art um, at the University of, um, in, at Monash University. And finally, that took her to her PhD in the University of Western Australia. So can you please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Hayes. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming out here on a Monday night. And okay, uh, let's let me just orient myself to the technology. Good evening. Yes, and thank you. Yes, I am Dr. Susan Hayes. I should just, yeah, thank you. All right, I'll get over it. Um, I might be unclear from time to time, and, and if so, can you just wave or just, you know, just let me know? I'm here actually for the International Association of Craniofacial Identification, so I'm not the only Dr. Bones in the house tonight. You could be sitting next to one of them. You'll probably be able to tell by the, if they ask any questions. It'll be like, yeah, okay, thank you very much. You know, yeah, cool. Okay, so the main focus of this talk is this particular case that I worked for Sydney Homicide for the Blanglow Angel, and that's the focus. And this is the first time, which is why I'm a little bit more nervous than I usually am. This is the first time I've actually presented this as a public science talk. I don't mean popular science, public science talk. In fact, it's the first time I've presented it as a talk to anybody. So if I fumble, um, just let me fall and I'll pick myself up again. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of used to that, so it's okay. But we just rock and roll, let's see what happens. Okay. All righty. What I want to do is I want to give you just a little bit of a background to where I came from, um, then give you a little bit of a few examples of my approach to this field, because it is as different as the strange and quirky people who populate it. So we all have a very different approach. We all use different methods. We all have different belief systems and different methods that we apply. Okay. So 
I was really fortunate and lucky to have been taken under the wing of Ron Taylor, who's actually in Brisbane tonight, but he's out with, with, with the big people. Um, and he was really, really kind to take me through the basics of 3D clay facial reconstruction, or facial approximation, which is what we prefer to call it in Australia. I think there's a, there's a sparkly thing here. Yeah. Now, Ron has this system where he uses matchsticks um, to, to, with the soft tissue depths, with the, the head of the match, actually constituting the skin layer. So it's like, danger, Will Robinson, do not estimate the face beyond the end of the wood bit before you hit the, the matchy bit. <laughs> Technical terms, just don't mind me. Um, but I was actually just a little bit on the retentive side and a little bit on the slow side, and that hasn't kind of changed. And so by the time I had finished my faces, the, the red of the mat should actually sort of postulated all over the face. So unless I was going to specialise in, I don't know, plague victims, um, I had to change to green lights, which, which, which hung in there for the whole, whole duration of the course, of the thing. Okay. Um, I then, now Ron suggested that on the basis of my amazing sculptural skills that I should probably take up drawing. So I was like, oh, okay, Ron, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I did. I actually sort of, um, well, at the start of my PhD, so I was doing a PhD in anatomy and human biology, specialising in only the head. Ask me not about anything to do with anything below this point, which is called the menton. All right, down here? Down there. Okay, really don't know. I'll give you an opinion, because hey, I'm a doctor. We've got lots of opinions, but I won't be very accurate. So, um, yes, yeah, so I went to the University of Dundee. This is Caroline, you might know her from some TV programs. And I learned this 2D approach, which I'm literally using tracing paper. So there is a photograph of the skull, layers of muscles, and then the facial appearance. What was fantastic about this experience during my PhD was I got to work with at least a dozen past forensic cases that Caroline had in her um, resource bucket. So it meant that I could actually slowly work from producing people that looked like Barbie and Ken to something that actually started to look more like the individual it was supposed to. And that was a great opportunity. Incredibly intense, but I really liked Dundee. It was a nice place. Okay, so I did that, and I actually applied that. So once I'd kind of like, um, this is my very, very first research paper collaboration, collaboration, and it was with, you know, as you do when you're just starting out, you're going to collaborate with the University of Paris, the University of Otago, um, Australian National University, and the University of West Australia about the Tumalapita, who are this amazingly important, everything's amazing tonight, I'm sorry. You get a word in your brain and it just stays there. So everything's amazing. Okay, so this is an amazing Tumala Pita. They um, are really quite enigmatic because they, um, they populated the Southeast Asia. Matthew Spriggs is his research specialization. They discovered them in Vanuatu. And Hallie Buckley from the University of Otago said, would you like to work on estimating the face and faces? And I said, yes, please. There was a little bit of computer graphics in this, not much. So, but right from the beginning, I was, this, is, this is ancient Photoshop, so I tell you, know, this is, anybody remember this screen from Photoshop? Um, so I was using, I was, uh, right from the beginning, I really looked for, I wanted to produce an outline of the skull at 400% magnification if I could. It forced me to completely focus on the unique morphology of every skull that I engaged with. It was a time of quiet for me and them. So, and that is, that is retained. The Excel spreadsheets have also retained. They've got a little bit bigger. I don't know if you've ever seen a program like Bones. Oh, yeah, you said the Bones thing, didn't you? Yeah, well, when Nikki does it, I want to do it how Nikki does it because Nikki's got the kind of skull there and Nikki goes... <laughs> and that's like... Where are your Excel spread cheeks, baby? You know, it's like, where is you sitting down there doing all the algorithms? Where is your lit review? Where is your pain and suffering? So I want to be Nikki. I would like to be Nikki in a number of other ways as well, but never mind, we did the publication. This publication came out in Leonardo, which neither of us at the time actually knew. It was a really, really big thing. Um, it's the nature of art and science, nature being a fairly big thing too. We haven't got there. Um, so, and the focus of this article was the advantage of drawing. Now, what was really intriguing about the Chima Lapita? Oh, there wasn't much written about these guys because the, up until the point that Matthew's excavation discovered all of these cranial skulls, 
there hadn't been any really found out. So when I was doing my lit review, I just kept learning about endentate pottery, which didn't really help me with the facial estimation, but I certainly learned about endentate pottery and I can actually now do some. So these, what the Lapita would do is that they would actually do a process of death and dying, um, which is, so this looks like this individual has got a jaw and there's another person there, that's their eyebrows, and maybe their jaw's underneath, and there's a third one here, which is one, two, three, in the same sequence. But what the Lapita do is that they kind of have a burial party, so, that, so the theory is, or the evidence might be, that they allow the bones to become defleshed and through natural processes, and then there's a bit of a mix and match. So this is actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people. It's a dinner party. You know, it's like it's, it's, it's not just one person. So rather than estimate a jaw to go with these three crania, because they couldn't actually get a match, what the advantage of this was, was that I could actually do basically three quarter faces down to the upper lip. And because we are trained to understand and recognize the conventions of drawing, it's easy, well I can, see them as whole faces rather than shattered half faces. So that was the Lapita. I'm loving this thing. So please tell me off if I play with it too much, okay? It's great. Ah, this is a slow slide. And then things changed. <laughs> Slowly. Yes, and then things changed. So this was um, further down the track, and I'm drawing, drawing, drawing. And um, the... It, the um, Hallie Buckley, again my colleague from the Timulapito University of Otago, said she had actually sort of, so she was um, collaborating with the Iwi Rangitani, who were seeking to have their ancestors returned from museums across New Zealand. I'm huge in New Zealand, well I was then, for a little time I was really famous in New Zealand. Um, and so I went, oh, so she asked the Iwi Rangitani, would they like to have the faces of their, es their ancestors estimated, because at that time, Halley was, had also been given permission to analyze all the remains before they were ceremonially reburied. And they said, yes, please. So I got flown over there, um, and only two of the individuals made it during the time that I was there to work and photograph and measure and do things with, with the bones, with the remains. And so I got back to Perth, which is where I was at the time, and Hallie said, can I send you CT scans? Would you be able to do your magic, as she called it, from CT scans? And I went, mm, no bones, you know, like no, no morphology, no feel, no in indications of muscle attachments and things. Not sure, but hey, okay, we'll do it. Um, and so this was my very, very first foray into working directly from CT scans, and I loved them. Now drawing, one of the frustration things with drawing, shouldn't really talk about clay at all, but one of the is, is that you cannot correct or check. I am a little bit into methodological transparency and I also don't do one method, I do methods. And a lot of these references down here, by the way, are to University of Queensland's um, Carl Stefan, which is why, who's actually hosting the International Association of Craniofacial Identification. He is, I think he's not here tonight. Carl, are you here? No, no, because he's entertaining the senior people. He has done more for this field than just about anybody in the world, and he is from Australia. It's, I mean, oh, sorry, Australia does this all the time, but it's just, he has just amazingly shifted and lifted the standard of estimating the face um, to, to really quite high levels, um, not exaggerating there. I exaggerate a lot, but not about that. So. Basically what I did here was, was applying Carl's methods. I actually sort of, I invented a whole series of virtual muscles. I took photographs of bits of meat um, and also took bits of meat off, you know, Google images and morphed and warped them into these series of muscles and did them all as individual layers and applied all of the kind of like the stuff that I needed to do and produced a virtual face. Now this is actually a female. At this point I was not putting hair on the heads of archaeological remains because there is no evidence and there continues to be no evidence between the skull and hair, style, growth patterns, texture, colour, 
Okay, so it, it's a bit of a random factor. So I hadn't bothered, but I did discover that a lot of my, the women that I worked with were seen to be bald men. So I thought, mm, maybe I should change things. So that was the CT, and I haven't looked back. I really haven't worked in a manual field other than teaching since. So it's become more and more graphic. It was bumpy, um, and I've, I've got a slide that I can think. So, at this time, I'm actually beginning to develop my particular approach. As I said, we all have our, have our unique ones, and mine is a very literate one, meaning that I will immerse myself in the research publications to do with a particular individual, to do with their um, population or ancestry, you know, whether they're European, Southern European, Northern European, Eastern European, Western European, whatever, um, how old they are, what sex they are, and also particular quirks because every single skull that I have ever worked with is astonishingly unique and always has a particular thing that I have to go and do a lot of research to try and figure out what's happening there. I'm also incredibly, amazingly, I am also um, strongly believing that whatever individual I'm working with, I should be citing the local researchers as much as I can. So I'm just somebody who's part of a team, I do what I do, but a lot of people have done a lot of work and research before I've even got there. So I try and do a lot of background research. It takes me a very long time to do what I do. I should get quicker. But anyway, the bubbles actually show you what I think is important. Research collaboration is huge. Um, I'm very rarely working with any individuals of my own particular national heritage. I'm usually working with individuals who is somebody else's child or somebody else's national heritage. So. Collaboration is important. Um, anyway. Don't. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> it's okay. So, these are just a few examples of stuff that's kind of been out there recently. Well, this is not so recently, but every time they have a new homophoriensis remain, my face pops up. This is um, actually what I'm talking about tomorrow at the IACI. Um, it's about the process of Hobbit. But well, the reason why it's here tonight is to illustrate that this was just part of the literature review that I had to do to get to here. Well, actually, she's got to get to there, to there, to there, to there. Um, I moved from modern human variation to pre-modern and all of the debates and arguments, and I had to read all of it. Uh, I'm not talking books here, I'm talking journal articles, peer-reviewed journal articles, and try and sort of shift the opinion pieces from the evidence and also had to repair the skull. And yeah, anyway, read a lot, but that's tomorrow. Um, another time, if you want me to talk about it, I'm happy to come back. Okay, so this is a very recent um, facial estimation that came out only, only about a month or so ago, um, and it was published in Antiquity, which is, is like a, um, a British um, archaeology journal. This was huge. I was really surprised it was very popular, possibly because, with the media, I mean, possibly because she lived 13 and a half thousand years ago. And what the media found really, really problematic was that she didn't kind of drag her knuckles along the ground. Um, but what it did was it actually sort of it really, really brought Razmi and, 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 and um, uh, Mon and Sanjay, uh, Professor Sanjay, and, and, and um, oh, Jin, Jin, yep, can, yep. <sighs> Nim, Nim. Sorry, everyone's name is not the name that is there, so you kind of have to remember the, the direct association. It really brought her research right up into the spotlight. So while the media leapt on the face and the fact that she was 13 and a half thousand years, ago, years old and she didn't look like a cave woman, um, at the same time they're talking about Rasmus' research. A lot of research is done by people in their own country, but unfortunately what tends to happen is that a lot of European you know, usually kind of English-speaking or French-speaking or German-speaking or whatever, Europeans fly in to collaborate with local researchers, are a little bit more speedy in publishing in, in English-language international journals, and then all of that research gets associated with the, FIFO, with the FIFO, with the European researcher. Everyone's really polite about it, but it's a bit of a downside of collaboration and language barriers. So Rasmus is really, really, really pleased that her research was finally out there in the public domain. Uh, okay. And this is um, another one. This is an example of revision. Um, this is, I went and worked in the Museum de la Plata in Argentina. If you ever go there, I really strongly do recommend going to this museum. It's fantastic. But this is the bumpy start that I was talking to you about. This was when I first started working in computer graphics. It was sad. It was not a good 
skilled result. I thought it was okay, but that's because I didn't know any better. Um, this is a few years down the track. I've got a little bit better at computer graphics, about mashups, about how to actually manipulate and what I need and how to control the whole thing. Um, but the other thing that's happened is that the methods have moved on. Thanks to Carl and I still and, 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 and his ilk and, and also Pierre, where are you? Yeah, bone man. Um, a whole lot of relationships have been re-evaluated and changed, including this one, and this was really significant to the forensic work I did for Sydney Homicide. So what I did was I actually took advantage, I've always felt a bit, 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 bit what Indonesia would say, malu, a bit shame about this, this particular <laughs> effort. Um, and so I took an advantage to update the face and also do a revision of all of the facial reconstructions that have appeared in museums, or about, sorry, about historical figures since 1900. And that was a methodological review. And if you really want to know what the state of play is in the field, read it, it's, it's, it's hell fun. Okay. Okay, and this is the last example, which is public science. I've just come back from about three and a half years in, in um, Tinggal di Indonesia, di Jawa. I've been living in, in, in Java for the last three and a half years. And um, I was actually giving most of my presentations in this really, really bad Indonesian. Bit of a problem for me is that I get pipi and pipis, a little bit confused. One means cheek and the other one means little boy pee. But it was luchu, it was an amusing way of, teach, of, of, of going through what I did. But I ha again, this was work with a woman who lived in Bali 2,000 years ago. Really interesting, she has ectopic um, canines, which is actually becoming more, um, we're becoming more aware of it through the x-rays. Um, but I also did, it's, it's an exhibition at the Museum Gare Pap Bator, and I also ran a drawing workshop. Because I have methodological transparency, because I can actually sort of literally turn my work into a PowerPoint show, I can run workshops for the public. Um, he's the driver. He was the best one. He was really good. Um, archaeologists, art students, whatever, I can actually run a public engagement. And this is great, when you, especially for working with archaeological remains that are not my national heritage because it means that I'm sharing or get to share and get to see the results of other people whose, whose national heritage it actually is. Okay. This is another example of public science that I do and have done for a long time. And this is what I was doing on Tuesday, the 16th of August, 2011. And it's actually what I'll be doing in August for National Science Week at the, at the Queensland Museum. So running a 3D workshop where I take people through how to sculpt muscles and, and clay and faces. So I was doing this, I was all kind of like happy, it was good, it was working well, I'm talking a lot, they're fine. It's, um, it's in the National Portrait Gallery foyer, people are walking around. I finish that day of the workshop, I go outside, I look at my ancient Nokia and it says, please call Sydney Homicide. And I went, <laughs> what have I done? I, th I genuinely got the guilt. So it's like, you know, I'm not, fr not, not from Sydney and, 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 and I don't know anyone in Sydney. Actually, I know two people in Sydney and they're married to each other. And strangely enough, when I was working in Sydney, on these remains. I went down to get strawberries because I just wanted to eat strawberries, I don't know why, um, and there were the two people that I knew. And it's like, hi, <laughs> yes, I'm in Sydney. <laughs> so, so that's what I was doing when I was asked to assist. Now this is the timeline structure of things. The remains were actually sort of, it's, it's, it covers about five years from when the remains were first identified to when they were identified, so when they first found to when they were identified in 2015. So it's quite a long period of time. It kind of covered quite a large part of my life. And I was not very cool about it. It's like it's, it's, um, it's a sad case of a young woman dying. Um, it's a sad case of everybody dying, actually, including my dad. And he wasn't a young woman when he died. But it was just, it was a major event. It was, they all are, actually. I don't know why I'm sort of trying to pretend they're different, but they're not. Okay, so. This is a young woman, and I'm just going to take you through this. We are now in Brisbane, yes, and this is Blanglo State Forest. Blanglo State Forest is in that other place down south. Um, it's halfway between Sydney and Canberra. It's a state forest, it's got all this undergrowth, and a couple of trail bike riders um, were out doing trail bike ridery things, and they came across these remains and called the police and it all sort of went from there. What they did was they tried to, they spent a year. The police that I finally, you know, that I actually met and worked with, they spent a very long time trying to identify this young girl or woman. Um, 
There was a T-shirt by the remains and it had the word angelic across it. Um, and that's why she became known as Angel in the media. Or the, the media say the police call her Angel, the police say the media call her Angel, but Angel was, was the name that it, it kind of like, it, it's, yeah, it was a very sad thing. So, on the 3rd of December, so they asked me if I would do what I do, and I sent them a copy of a research paper saying, this is my approach, this is where it's going to go. Um, it'll be a grayscale image because it's, you know, rather than colour for various reasons. I put a whole lot of stipulations about, and also I'm slow. And they said, fine, but can she have hair, please? I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, okay. Um, and I didn't know that it was a first for Sydney homicide. Like, they'd never actually sort of participated in this process before. Um, and I was pleased I didn't know for a while. Um, so, it, it, the media did what the media did. The media are really, really generous with this story. They put it everywhere and they kept publicising it. So, it wasn't just a one-off. Um, they also, you know, it, it just kept popping up again and again, but with no joy. It did, um, as a, 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 an estimated face, it did what it was supposed to do, which is that it, it actually generated 132 unique new leads to identification. But there was a bit of a problem and I was kind of responsible a bit because every time I went and gave a public talk or I ran a workshop or I was invited somewhere, I would take the brochures and I would just say, look, you know, hand these out somewhere, just trying to get the word out. And so they were getting little bubbles of potential leads and identifications from places just where I happened to be giving a talk. It's a bit... I mean, that's great and that's good, but what happens, and I hadn't realised at that time, is that when um, they, they, the police have to check out every lead, which is absolutely what they should do, and that's not a sad thing, that's not a bad thing. It's the people who they have to go and check out, who, you know, oh, you're missing your daughter, someone suggested this might be her, um, do you have any clothing, artefacts, DNA stuff, you know? Um, and of course, the whole family goes through that entire tragedy all over again. And this is also pretty stressful, I would imagine, on the police as well, having to do this, which I feel that I was a little bit... Res I mean, this is what I was supposed to be doing, but, you know, this is, a, this is, this is serious stuff. You know, this is people's fears and emotions. Um, very much out there. So, shifting things. So what I did was I, went, um, I had already received, um, because I said I wanted to undertake this as applied research and that, if possible, I would like to do a research publication. Sydney Homicide gave me permission, or you know, the big people in Sydney Homicide gave me permission to publish this as, as, as a research paper in the International Journal of Forensic Science or Forensic Science International, as it's better known. This went through everything that I did. Now, I don't have a method. You might hear about the American method. You might not. But anyway, there is a method, and then there's one that's actually a whole array of different methods that are in peer-reviewed journal articles. So that's kind of what I do. It's you know, the more kind of slow stuff. Um, and so what I did was I described all of the methods that I did to apply to estimate the face, but at the same time I thought, well, can't, you know, what's everybody else doing? Um, and so what I did was I actually compared what I, I actually looked and see, to see, most, I was most interested in what soft tissue depths they applied and also how did they estimate the facial features? Because in a lot of the popular handbooks, there's very, very little information about that and I wanted to know what is, what's, you know, what's out there? What is actually sort of gaining traction within the, the facial reconstruction community as it's more popularly known? I was a bit surprised to find out that those myself and Carl are the only two researchers in the world at that point to have published a paper about a genuine, real um, facial identification. So the rest are lab, are lab products. I was, I was really quite surprised about that. Okay. She did get identified. Um, she didn't get identified through the work that, that, that we did. She was identified through her young child being f body being found and there was a DNA match. And then the lines got joined together and they found out who she was. Um, at the time, I was in Flores on a dig. My partner's a paleontologist, so I was um, just you know, doing the brushwork thingy, because it's fun, it's better than Photoshop, it gets my back stretched and stuff like that. So that's me amongst all the workers doing the thing. 
Um, the Illawarra Mercury Blaston reported that Dr. Hayes was at her dig, which kind of caused everybody else in Bajara a little bit of surprise that, that I, was, I was actually their boss. And although the West Australian and I think Channel 7 reported that the work that we'd done was an amazing likeness to, to, to um, Carly um, J. Pierce Stevenson, the West Australian's my home state. Do you know what I mean? It's just a bit like my mum. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, 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 thanks, guys. Don't do that. You're embarrassing me. So, within, um, a few, once I'd sort of got back from the dig, um, I actually then had the opportunity to evaluate what I'd done. And again, I was really surprised that nobody had actually done this. They'd done this in, um, like, through visual assessments and things, but nobody had actually looked at the actual face and the facial features and compared, this is what I did for a forensic case, this is what the person looks like, what worked, what didn't. But one of the problems um, that people always face is that um, the estimated face is in, a, is in anatomically formal position or even, you know, it, it, it's in a particular head pose and the ante mortem, the images of, 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 of the intended person are usually sort of randomly, you know, Posed, and they've also got limit, you know, changes of, of, of photo quality and stuff. So it's really, really hard to do a one-to-one -one numerical comparison between the work that was done and the results themselves. I have a different string to my bow. I won't talk to you about this as well, but I also do a lot of statistical shape analysis and I do a lot of photo identification using statistical shape analysis, but that's not the point tonight. Um, but that involves using a software called Geometric Morphometrics, which is statistical shape analysis. This means putting landmarks on the face. And these are landmarks, which are XY coordinates. Um, oops. Sorry. Um, putting them into the database, and this is an example of the three faces up here and the estimated face down here. Within that... Um, database, I also had 64 images of young women, the same age as, as, as Carly Jade Pierce Stevenson. I don't call her Carly, she's not my daughter, but I really wish she'd had a shorter name. Um, and I, with the 64 images, there were also ones that were matched to her um, head pose variation, her, her cheek uh, dominance, and also there was a whole range of facial shapes and also slightly smiling facial expressions to allow for this and this, all closed mouth smiles. Yes, it did take me a while to find 64 images that complied to these variables, but it was necessary. And the results of the analysis, and I won't bore you with the details, but if you want to know the details, then please ask me a question, um, or maybe after the talk, um, is that, okay, so these three images, so not just one image of of the person, but three images went into the analysis, and this is the overall result of the multivariate regression, where here is the facial approximation, here is Miss Pierce, Pierce Stevenson when she's younger, here is the frontal view, and over here is a picture that doesn't look like her at all, but it is a picture of her. So the facial approximation looks more similar to two photographs of her and not the third. What this suggests is if you are going to do a photo comparison, you need more than one image because had I run this analysis, then I would be like, oh, it really didn't work. Um, but it worked a bit. Okay. Uh, the way that the database worked was I compared how Miss Pierce Stevenson differed from the database of 64 images, so what was distinctive about her and what was distinctive about the facial approximation, and they basically agreed with each other overall in general terms. It was a bit of a work. Are you reading this? Do you want me to read it out to you? No. So, when I did the police report, so I give the police reports, I don't think, I think they'd rather I didn't give them quite so much information, but they get the full report and I said, this is what's being predicted here, is that she's got um, a wide face, wide jaw, wide spaced eyes, long nose, short upper and lower lip, nose to mouth, mouth to thing, a suggestion of a high chin. And so that actually went in the report, and my hope was that they would actually report that in the, in the media as well, because, you know, rather than have this, this result, you know, knock out any potential um, people. 
Um, and basically, they generally agreed with each other. There's a whole lot of different, different assessments that I did, not just these. This is not the convincing argument. It did get through the peer review uh, and it got published. Okay, so it's, it's, yeah, it worked at that level, but it didn't work wonderfully well. Okay, it was, there were some major flaws in it, um, particularly, and so that the, oh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> this, is, this is for me more than you. Um, the green is the facial approximation. And you can see it's too short, this green line here. Too short and too wide. Um, Miss Pierce Stevenson's in black. You can see that the eyes are wrong, the nose is too long, the mouth's in the wrong spots. So it didn't work that well. It worked kind of statistically, but really not in these areas. And let's just briefly go through. Okay, why was the facial height and width wrong? Well, one, um, it was based on photographs, so there's an element of photographic distortion happening there, I'm sure. Uh, two is that the soft tissue depths were put onto this. So while I size match these photographs to being orthogonal, as, as close to orthogonal as possible, but that would be impossible, um, you're still going to get this kind of like strange discrepancy that they were, you know, they've been applied on after the event. And also, I made a very common error in this field. I got the angles of the soft tissue depths wrong. Now, the people that actually talked about it, anyway, it was, it was a major misunderstanding of the research literature that got taken up in the, in the popular forensic literature that, anyway, I followed a common error in the process. So I actually followed unverified forensic recommendations. Never mind. Um, why were her, okay, I've got much more responsibility for eye spacing. I was bad. Eye height was because I followed a surgical um, recommendation for iris dimensions, and it was wrong. <laughs> Where's one's faith in the professions? Again, I was referring to a book and not a peer-reviewed journal article. And again, in my defense, this was 2011. I feel like I was young, naive, and silly then, because I believed things that were in print that hadn't been peer-reviewed. Um, and eye spacing, Carl had only just come out with a, with a publication that said that rather than the forensic recommendation of the eyeball being centrally located in the orbit, the up a little and out. But you see, Carl had only done this study on seven cadavers, all of whom were like seriously a lot older than this young woman. And so, I, oh, the basis of seven. Mm. So I kind of like, I, 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 I wimped out a bit and only went one metre up and one metre out. But this was also because I had a mistaken assumption that there is another agreement about the eyes that, that, that is that the, the medial, the inner corner of the iris is roughly where the mouth corner is. And also there's a little thing here, a little hole down here called the mental foramen and that's roughly where the mouth corner is as well. And I'd sort of like everything, so, and I'd done all these different other algorithms for calculating mouth width and mouth height, and I just didn't want to kind of, if I shifted the eyes out, then everything just fell apart. And I naively, naively? <laughs> I stupidly thought that the whole face had to be in harmony. Now, every time I give a public lecture, I say, yes, but because, even though I'm applying verified science, they are based on statistical averages of human variation. And of course, nobody in this room is average. I have never met an average skull. I've never seen an average face unless I've created one statistically. But I still assumed that this young woman had to agree with all of the average correlations of the stuff that I was applying, which is silly. Um, the nose, I don't really quite understand. I just actually want to flip forward here because of the two compounding factors. The other thing I did was, again, with average relationships, was that um, here we have tooth sockets, really, really common for even archaeological, paleontological, and recent remains to not have their upper teeth. Um, they're single-rooted, so they drop out quite easily. And I've also been told, but I haven't read it in a peer-reviewed publication, that bull ants really like them. It's a god to bullance. And they, they, they take the tooth and they take it down deep into their nest. And strangely enough, CSI don't want to go digging down there. I say, I need those teeth, I need those. No. Okay, so often, and they, they just get lost as well. 
they're quite small. Um, so they were not there. So I didn't have any information to estimate lip height. As it turned out, the algorithm that I could have used to estimate lip height had problems, but probably fewer problems than applying an average. So I just did average lip height. Um, and, okay, oral fissure, where's the mouth? Slip located, I followed Grey's Anatomy, not the TV show, the book, yeah? Strandring, 2000 and whatever, the, the latest one. That the oral fissure is roughly the same place as where the canines terminate. So here's the, here's the, termi the canine. Maybe I should, yeah, probably should have dropped it a bit lower. No, that's not canine. One, yes it is. So around here, or was it P1? Can't remember, anyway, I got it in the wrong spot. Too high. So, with a combination of factors, and we go back to the nose. Let me go back to the, let me go back to the nose. If I, if I hit it again, it's gonna do two, isn't it? Yeah? But I'll try. Oh yeah, there you go, okay, good. So, with a combination of the mouth being positioned too high in the face, even only by like a couple of mils, but the lip height being too high, um, and of the nose being inexplicably too long, because even though the algorithm I used has been found by other studies to have an error rate of 6.7% in height, it's actually okay. Um, this actually meant that the upper lip was really short. Okay, so it actually had this compounding effect. I do remember giving a public talk once in the wilds of Northwest Australia, and one of the people said, who's geologist or an archaeologist, said, why don't you do the average plus one standard deviation this way and plus one standard deviation that way? It's not just one method I'm applying. I'm applying a whole suite of different methods, all of which have an average and one standard deviation this way and that way. So it's impossible to have an average plus one standard deviation. You can't just come out with one version of the face. Uh, sorry, with multiple versions of the face or cohering. So that was a bit of a problem doing that. So, oh, and finally, I should talk about hairstyle. Um, what I did was, I mean, I, 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 I was really <laughs> made some quite sad attempts at hair. Uh, the remains, her, remains of hair was, were found near the, the remains themselves. Hair is actually quite durable. It'll be in nests and things. Um, and so what we did was myself and the senior senior um, investigating officer, we measured each one of the strands. We, gr we grouped them into, into groups. Um, and I used an eyedropper tool in Photoshop on the photographs to get the tonal variation. We thought, me and um, um, the officer, we thought that, okay, and it was, it was kind of wavy, it was undulating. So we thought she had wavy hair. That was one assumption we made. And the other assumption we had was that the longest hair would be from the top of the head, yeah? And Sally, who's the hairdresser, um, the police very generously let me consult with the hairdresser because I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not, you know, this is outside of my expertise. Sally's been cutting hair for 20, 30 years. Um, you know, she kind of, and she knew what was popular during the time frame, I think it was 2000 to 2010. It was a big time frame, but she knew what the dominant hairstyles were. And so she looked at these, and she said, no, 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 it'll be straight. Because in her experience as a hairdresser, as soon as hair leaves the scalp by being, just by being cut, it bounces. And curly hair turns into, goes into these tight little balls. So there is a tendency, obviously, without the weight of hanging down, for hair to just get a little bit wavy. So we got it wrong on many accounts. This is actually the longest part of the hair down here. As far, you know, she's a hairdresser, she knows what she's doing. We didn't have a clue. And she suggested that this was probably the closest style. She, mm, I boofed it up a bit much. I think um, I was a bit concerned with the facial width, which is why I dropped this round here to try and narrow the face a little bit. Um, but Sally, I think, you know, especially with the long side fringe, she got it spot on. My recommendation to all police departments is that, and all people who practice this field, is consult with the people that know this stuff. She was good. She did good. I was, I was like, yes, go. So I say that because there was some discussion among other people that maybe the hairdresser, huh? It's like, yes, she knows her stuff. So, to conclude, what works? 
was probably good, but I don't know much about it, is automa automated facial identification. She sat statistically within a cluster with the facial approximation. So, yay, in general terms, good O. What didn't work, and is very probably, I say probably, but I know that it's actually very bad familiar face recognition, was these discrepancies, particularly in vertical heights. The way that we recognize our loved ones is through their facial feature configuration. We do still recognize them if they change their hair color or if they happen to turn sideways onto us. We've got quite a robust structure for recognizing people we know, but it gets really upset by configuration. So had her mother actually thought she was missing, she probably, she might have been disrupted probably by the errors that were there. Oh, and I should point out that by the way, perfection is not possible. This is why I keep moving between approximation and estimation, okay, and not reconstruction. Nothing's getting reconstructed here. It's getting estimated with the best that we know, but as I said, no one's average. And also there's user error. What I personally think was the very, very bestest, bestest, bestest things on a whole heap of levels was that we could actually evaluate the results. It's changed methodologi uh, methodologically for the first time in over 100 years. It's actually possible to estimate the face using methods that you can actually justify and critique. And also, yay, she got identified. That's the end of my bit. Now it's over to your questions. Thank you so much to Dr. Susan Hayes. So can relax a little bit, but <laughs> you we'll, keep, we'll keep you right there. <laughs> the questions to, are to take come care forward. of the questions. <laughs> we have about um, a good 15 minutes or so for questions, Ooh. and the lovely ladies, Leonie and Dominique, are just gonna come down shortly and start collecting your questions. So if you can hand it to them as they come round. In the meantime, I will tell you a little bit about what's going on next month. So in next month's Bris Science really? Lecture, we have um, not one, but four presenters. And they will be here telling you a little bit about Moreton Bay. And Moreton Bay is incredibly interesting because it is an o it, it, it's, its own ecosystem unlike any other and it houses things from the tiniest to the largest. It can even accommodate the really iconic sea turtles and dugongs. So how exactly are, you know, how exactly are our scientists nowadays um, protecting that reef uh, will be the key topic in next month's lecture. So don't forget to get tickets if you're interested. So we have a few questions. And I've got another one coming here. Awesome, we'll hang in there for that one. <coughs> I'll just check Twitter now, just to see if we've oh, got any come me. through. Awesome. I've never tweeted. <laughs> tweeted, yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, until a recent election somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, I wasn't that familiar <laughs> with the process. All right, we might start with a question from Twitter. This is from... Um, Technology always. Look, you yeah. physically made it here. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Well, the question, okay. this question is from Catherine. So, Hello, Catherine. Susan, yes. what are the benefits and limitations of hand drawing and digitally approximating faces? Okay, so the benefits of hand drawing is that you get to have fuzzy edges. So the benefits of hand drawing is you can also just do three quarters of the face. Um, the huge benefits for me, of, okay, the danger of working computer graphically is it can look a bit firm, but I actually blur it up. Um, I use a filter and actually make it look quite fuzzy. When I did the uh, homophoresy, I'm doing this, I'm doing this for a reason. <laughs> when I did the homophoresiensis face, they wanted to do t-shirts and they got really frustrated with the print because it looks sharp, but that's how visual process is working. So I actually, unfortunately, my work does get more hits than it probably should because it looks like a lot of people because they've got a lot of fuzzy edges. Does that answer the question? Sounds good. Yeah. Now we have a few technical questions. A fleshy here. question. Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 no. Yep, it's fine. Okay, yep. Actually, that will tie in quite nicely. Okay. So let's go. These are the technical ones. I've never done a this question yet. from our audience member Belinda. How do you estimate the appearance of an older person? Because you would assume the skull doesn't change very much. Okay. Where's Belinda? Just so that Belinda's over here. Hi, Belinda. Um, it does. 
Well, organic, we grow until we, um, we stop. When we stop growing, everything... Um, what happens is skulls keep growing. There are particular signs of ageing. Um, mostly, it's, it's better post... Well, there are signs of ageing in the skull due to tooth wear, but there's also clues often post, post-cranial. As I said, I not me. But the skull actually does keep growing until we die. Um, it doesn't... We're not going to all turn into... into Somebody with a very large head. <laughs> um, but it, it does keep going. We are organic. And so one of the myths of adolescence is that that's our growth. It's actually our growth spurt. Um, well, for boys. Girls just go, nah. <laughs> I'm going to stay like this until the menopause, baby. Um, so it's, it's, it's different growth changes. So it's, it would be very hard to put an old face on a younger skull. I also tend not to want to overly emphasise the ageing process in the face. Um, as some people have young faces for their age, some people have young bones for their age. So the wobble room is quite big. The more you get into verified methods, the more it actually gets less absolute. And I trust that stuff that's not absolute. Um, but what I've also found when I was doing a different research project with a police artist, describing colleagues, people were de describing their friends basically, the longer they'd known that person, the younger they described them. So if you want to stay young forever, <laughs> don't change your friends. <laughs> Some good advice there. Roughly there, but yeah. <laughs> okay, our next question, also a technical one. Given that the nose is composed of such soft tissue, mm -hmm. how do you estimate a nose, given that you wouldn't really get that from a skull? Well, that's not quite true. The nose is actually kind of like one of the most amazingly studied part of human anatomy, not just within this field, but also within rhinoplasty. Um, so the relationship of, of hard tissue to soft tissue in the nose is relatively well known, although there's more and more validation studies. Are, look, we know surprisingly little about the face given that that's all that I'm looking at at the moment is faces and that's all that we see on TV is faces. But the nose, who asked the question? Where are we? Just so that I can tune back in on you, not so that I can pick on you. Over there. Oh, yeah, big, yeah, 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 yeah. So we actually, so there's, um, I'm a bit of a literalist in the interpretation of the data about the nose. So one of the findings is that if the nose, the bony bit, the nose, the nose hole, the nasal aperture, if that's angled, then that actually relates to an angled nasal wing. And if it's curved, it'll relate to a curved nasal wing. I actually will actually literally impose that shape because I don't want to subjectively interpret to what extent is it curved, to what extent is it angled. Um, there is... Nasal projection underwent a radical revision recently, which was validated by Dr. Pierre. Wave again. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. CT scans. CT scans have had an amazing. Is that word again? <laughs> if you're playing bingo, someone's going to start going, hey, bingo, I've got 12 amazings. Um, so it's, um, okay, nasal projection used to be thought that the nasal spine, which is the little pokey out bit under here, that that projected out and estimated the nasal tip. That was actually from a Russian text that had been translated into German and then translated into English. And somewhere along the way, things got a little bit lost and confused and it's actually the base of the nasal aperture um, lateral to the uh, anterior nasal spine. There's quite a lot about the nose. Um, email me and I'll send you the literature or just ask Dr. Pierre, or anybody who actually is in this room from the conference. Can conference people put their hands up and wave a bit if they want to? Very yep, nice. there's conference people Excellent. here. Yeah. So pick an expert. Yeah. But Dr. Hayes, would Pick that on be them about the nose. Ha, sorry. So besides the nose, would that be similar for, for ear estimation? Ears, we know jack nothing. And that, we also know that thanks to Dr. Yeah. Um, so, there were all of these recommendations within forensic handbook literature. Um, I mean, all this stuff came out of the 70s, right, when people were just into having an opinion, man, um, and, um, and not validating their opinions and their experience. So, they were doing experience, yeah, anyway. Um, so, there's all these things that the angle of the ear is related to the angle of the jaw, and you've got these, I usually have a skull with, 
just happened to have personally pre-prepared <laughs> a vase here. Unfortunately, not... No, sorry, okay. So behind the ear, there's a, and you can feel it behind you here, there's a knobbly bit. It's called the mastoid process. That actually is, is, is an attachment for the sternocleidomastoid. So you've got sternum, I went to sternum, clavicle, cleidomastoid, muscle, okay? Now, in the forensic science literature, if that's bumpy and projects, then you've got really big ears. So there's all of these poor deceased people who happen to have sternocleidomastoid attachments that are a bit bumpy being sort of given this. It's not true. There was no statistical relationship between the... Oh, yeah, there is one. Where your ear hole is, is strangely enough, this soft tissue, strangely enough, is in quite close proximity to where the bony ear hole is, which would be a bit strange if it was up here. That's it. Is that the only one? Yeah. <laughs> so ears, ears here, I mean, this is the, the hairstyle, note, hairstyle, um, it is absolutely speculative. However, you would probably be a little hard pressed if you kept all of your eyes forward. And I said, please describe the ear of the person next to you. It's a little bit like, you know, it's not something that we take into account unless they're outstanding okay. or absent. Excellent. Thank you. We have one more technical question. Um, how does race or sex or gender influence the way we estimate someone's face? Someone's face. Um, look, <clears throat> I've got some really bad news for you guys, but um, the skull is not very good for sex. Okay? <laughs> Just don't go there. It's not where babies come from. <laughs> it's where you think about it, but they come from here. And that's why I can't really fit that well into my partner's genes and he can't fit that well into mine. So it's about pelvis. Pelvis is where babies come from. I'm sorry to sh You knew this already, right? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to shock some of you, but yeah, the skull is not good for sex. Um, in fact, if we happen to have a mass disaster here and now, apart from my talk, um, you would probably think, if you were the CSI investigator, that I'm a bloke because I'm postmenopausal. Um, I did that just for you tonight so I could actually answer this question. <laughs> um, and so therefore I'm actually developing brow ridges. And possibly because I can be quite expressive with my face, I've probably got quite a bumpy jaw and stuff like that. So I'm actually sort of becoming sort of gender neutral in my skull and would be assumed to be male because I'm not totally Grace Allen Jellic with no face anymore. So that's sex. We've dealt with sex now. Yeah. So. Skull not good for sex. I mean, there are obvious extremes, like with babies. There are obvious extremes where a baby actually kind of looks a bit like a girl. You don't need the pink stuff. It kind of looks a bit like a boy, and you don't need the blue stuff, but mostly babies look like babies. Mm. So it's kind of like skulls are a bit like that. They're a bit gender neutral. The way that I can actually tell that I'm looking at males and females as I glance around the room is the five o'clock shadow that you don't have, that you do. Yeah, it's a male person here, female person here. So we've got textual clues and, of course, social conditions, social expectations of dress and makeup and things. But, you know, that's not necessarily just a feminine prerogative. What about race? Is that populations? That, mm, um, demographic, yeah. We're all kind of human. So, <laughs> honestly, um, so we're actually. We're all actually related. I'm afraid you are my family and I'm related to you and that's kind of inescapable. So we're actually all, all part of the human, can, human, modern humans. We're all related to each other. We all have a very common ancestor. Well, they're probably not that common. Maybe they're even kind of quite fancy, but they're all the same person. So the way that you get population differences through, and, and I might get some co corrections from the floor from the experts here, but my kind of gloss on the thing is that Okay, if that row were all, unlike me, able to have many, many babies, took off and disappeared to the outback Queensland and just, or, you know, took off to an island somewhere, and this row down here took off to a different island, and, oh, I don't know, rows six, seven, and nine also took off, but you're all assuming that you're all fertile and, and up for it, no one has a headache, um, you would actually create a population that's quite distinct based on your particular characteristics. 
you would have what's called founder effect, which is that your particular characteristics would be more dominant than any other population just because it's you guys. All right? So you've got founder effect and genetic drift. So this is kind of like populations. Population. We are very plastic in our skulls. Um, Boas, I think it was, was an anthropologist from the post-war World War II, found that people who had migrated to the US and had babies in the US, their babies' skull dimensions were statistically different from those who'd had babies in the home country due to the influence of diet and environment. We are cockroaches. Ladies and gentlemen, we adapt. Well, cockroaches don't necessarily adapt. I think they've been the same for millions of years. Really bad analogy. But we are very plastic. We are very, very good at adapting to environment. And our faces will also reflect what we eat. Who our parents ha happen to be. Um, and there is some evidence that we will tend to, um, tend to kind of <laughs> be attracted to our parents in another body form. Okay? Not literally, but, you know, that... The women will be more attracted to men who look a little bit more like daddy and boys will be more attracted to women who look a little bit more like mummy. It's, it's kind of like there's, there's on average, on average, okay? So there is this kind of shift towards sameness. So you've got population drift. It's basically our lived experience through time, through what we ate, what we like to cook. And, and so, oh, and the other thing is that... Um, <laughs> which pre-modern human our ancestors decided to have sex with. So if your ancestors survived the cold climate of Europe by um, having relations with the Neanderthal, then their particular skin, their, their mutation was inherited. So most people who can claim a European population ancestry are genetic mutants where, we ha where our, our skin does not produce enough melanin. So, and this was a really good adaptation because it got us through some cold winters, okay? So I can say we because I've got the pale stuff. Um, rumpy pumpy Neanderthals, me, my ancestor. Um, but what it means is, is that you can tell a lack of functioning cells. So we all have the same number of cells, but people with paler Neanderthal-induced genetic mutations their cells don't function very well. So their skin is paler. It was a survival characteristic. This also comes through with eye colour, so I have hazel eyes. I mean, my melanocytes don't, are not that bad compared to somebody with, like, with blue eyes. Um, and I've got sort of brown hair, okay? Which, again, is not that bad. I've got a reasonable amount of melanin compared to somebody who's blonde. So have I what I've got? Sex? Population? What else did you want? <laughs> I think that was it. Was that yeah. it? <laughs> Evolution 101, but Evolution. kind of like somewhat exaggerated, so please don't yeah. email me. <laughs> <laughs> Can we give Dr. Susan Hayes oh, another okay. round, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you That's so good. much. And I guess really thank you to Dr. Hayes because she, you know, constantly throughout her talk has reminded us the importance of evidence-based learning and investigation. Um, thank you so much for that. So if you'll join me now for some dinner, we have catered for you. Hopefully we have enough food, okay? And hopefully we'll see you in next month's Brist Science. Thank you all so much for coming.